Welcome to West Fort Baptist Church online for Sunday, June the 6th. We are pleased to have you joining with us today. Grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every week we provide a couple of opportunities for people to meet in uh, groups online using Zoom. So Tuesday evening we have a very informal time of sharing and prayer at 7 p.m. And on Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we do a Bible study. Right now, we're finishing off the book of Titus. Daily bread booklets that began on June the 1st are uh, still available from our mailbox. This will be the last week that we'll keep those in there. So if you need one, you want, you like using that in your quiet time with the Lord, you can swing by our home, 102 Glendale Crescent, and... Um, Pick one of those up or take a few if you want to give them uh, to others. We are looking forward, Lord willing, to having an outdoor service, if the plan goes uh, the way that it's supposed to, on Father's Day, Sunday, June the 20th. Just be praying along with us as uh, we seek to settle on an appropriate location. The city is not opening uh, the parks for large gatherings until later on. So that's why we can't use the uh, place that we were meeting in last summer. So uh, just be praying along with us concerning that. Um, today we are continuing our series in the Psalms. And uh, today we're looking at Psalm 28, a uh, psalm that I've entitled, God Answers Prayer. Um, I would encourage you to follow along as I read Psalm 28. I'm reading from the New International Version. To you I call, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help. As I lift up my hand, hands towards your most holy place. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done and bring back upon them what they deserve. Since they show no regard for the works of the Lord and what his hands have done, he will tear them down and never build them up again. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. This is God's word and we thank him for it. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have your word, that we can know who you are and grow to understand uh, your love and grace and justice as we read the scriptures. And today, Lord, as we come to Psalm 28, all of our hearts need to be encouraged with the truth that you hear and answer prayer. Father, we come uh, to you uh, still in uh, the midst of the, the restrictions on us because of the pandemic. And so we continue to pray concerning that. We pray, Lord, for those uh, who are leading our country and those who are leading uh, health units and making decisions uh, concerning our welfare and the reopening of our uh, society. And we pray that you would guide them and give them wisdom and lead them in the way that they should go. And help us, Lord, as believers, just to continue to trust in you, to know that you are at work, that nothing restricts you or stays your hand uh, from doing your will. And so we thank you that you 
are the sovereign king over all, that we can bring everything to you and know that you hear and answer prayer. Father, our hearts are heavy for uh, the First Nations people uh, in Canada. Uh, just the, the whole turmoil and trauma that has been stirred up with the finding of those 215 uh, graves of children out in Kamloops, BC. So we pray for comfort, Lord, uh, for those who have been deeply affected by this. We do pray, Lord, for justice to be done and, and for healing among our First Nations friends. So God, work in their lives. We do pray for saving grace as well, that your Holy Spirit would move in our country, Father, uh, in such a way that men and women and boys and girls would be brought uh, to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So Father, we, uh, we yield our hearts to you now in this time of study around your word. And we look forward to the day when we can gather once again in worship and, and see one another face to face and rejoice in singing your praises. In the meantime, Lord, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to gather in this way and pray your blessing on our time around your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here is uh, what we're going to be doing with uh, Psalm 28 in our time together. Uh, verses 1 and 2, God, are you listening? Verses 3 to 5, judge justly. Verses 6 to 7, thank you, Lord and verses eight and nine, save your people. Now, God answers prayer. That, that is all over the Bible, isn't it? Let me share with you an amazing answer to prayer that I trust will encourage your heart. This happened years ago during the ministry of Dr. Helen Rosevere, who was a medical missionary to the Congo. And she told the story of a mother on her mission station who died after giving birth to a premature baby. They tried to improvise an incubator using a hot water bottle, but it was so old that it was beyond repair. And so they prayed for the baby and also her older sister who was now an orphan. One of the girls in the group prayed this way, Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late. And dear Lord, send a doll for her sister so she won't feel so lonely. That afternoon, a parcel arrived from England and the children watched as they opened it. To their surprise, under some clothing was a hot water bottle. Immediately, the little girl who had prayed dug deeper into the parcel. She was sure that God would provide the doll that she had prayed for and sure enough, she was right. The Heavenly Father knew of the child's prayer. Five months before that morning prayer, he had led a women's group in England to include both of those specific items in their parcel to the mission station. So that's, and there's lots of stories we could tell, and maybe you have stories of your own that you treasure, that encourage your heart with the amazing truth that God hears and answers prayer. Cling to those because, uh, as is often the case, there are times when it seems that God isn't listening and we pray and we pray and we pray and we aren't getting any response back whatsoever. That's where David is in uh, his life as he is writing Psalm 28 and you can feel uh, the urgency as David writes in Psalm 28 verses 1 and 2, to you I call, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands toward your most holy place. David was at the point that if God continued to remain silent, he's saying, I'm as good as dead 
See what he says there in verse 1? I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. The word there is Sheol, which is uh, the abode of the dead. Now, there are some prayers, and we understand that God has a purpose and a plan for everything that takes place in our lives. And uh, sometimes his uh, answer to us is wait, that there's, there's uh, something that God is, wants to do maybe in our lives as we, as we persevere in prayer. But that's the thing I think that we can see here is that even as David has prayed concerning this matter, he perseveres in prayer. There are some prayers, of course, uh, that people pray that aren't going to be answer, answered, like the, like the prayer that Nikki Gumbel, the author of the Alpha Bible Study series, uh, says that, uh, you know, a student who hands in a test paper and prays, oh God, please let Paris be the capital of England. Like, that, that's just not gonna work, right? Um, but, there are other, other things, legitimate things, that burden our hearts that we bring to, bring to God in prayer. And uh, what we see here, what we learn from David, as it seems that God is not listening, is to persevere and continue praying. Uh, the ESV in verse 2 translates it this way, Hear the voice of my pleas. So it's plural there, indicating that David has been praying repeatedly for a while about this same thing. Um, you know, we know how much it hurts to write an email or a text and not get an answer back, right? Uh, how much more important it is to hear back from God. Hearing from God really is the most important thing in life. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4 in his temptation in the wilderness. He said that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So hearing back from God is really the most important thing in life. David here is not being belligerent or uppity. Uh, he's asking for mercy. He's not demanding his rights. The same kind of attitude is reflected in uh, the parable that Jesus told about the tax collector and the Pharisee who went to the temple to pray. And the tax collector, he couldn't even lift his eyes up, right? He's beating his chest and he's, he's just humbly saying to God, God be merciful to me a sinner. That's the same attitude that we see here as David casts himself out on God's mercy. As a physical expression of urgency, David says here, I lift my hands toward your most holy place. And uh, so David knows that he's a sinner, right? We have, we have the record of his life laid out for us in all the gory detail in uh, 1 and 2 Samuel. And we have his prayers in the Psalms especially Psalm 51, where he comes before God just, and just opens up about his sin and asks for cleansing and mercy. So David knows that he's a sinner. But the beautiful thing here is that God had provided a place, a, a most holy place in the tabernacle or in the temple uh, where sacrificial blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat for guilty sinners. And when, when someone came before God, knowing that they had to confess their sin, they, know, they knew uh, that God had provided a way for people who were guilty to receive forgiveness because of God's mercy. And that is where David is directing his attention as he cries out to God once more, Having prayed repeatedly and not receiving an answer, he prays again and again, banking on the mercy of God. C.H. Spurgeon, in his wonderful commentary, The Treasury of David, uh, talked about it this way. We stretch out empty hands for we are beggars. We lift them up towards the mercy seat of Jesus 
We lift them up, for we seek heavenly supplies. And uh, so that captures the idea behind what David is doing here as he cries out to God once again. Now, on this side of the cross, of course, in the New Testament, we, have, uh, we are encouraged to continue praying uh, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 that reads this way, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence or boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So our attention is not so much on a geographical place as David mentions uh, here in these opening verses, but it's on the fulfillment of uh, mercy and grace happening at the cross where Jesus died on our behalf. And so that enables us to come boldly with confidence before the throne of grace. Now in the first part, verses one and two, David pleads to God, his rock, simply to be heard. He's saying to God, please hear my pleas. And now we come to verses three uh, to five, and this is the heart of David's prayer. Uh, so he says in verse three, do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. One of the surest things that we see in the Bible is that God will judge the wicked. There isn't pulling, any pulling of the wool over God's eyes. He will not miss a thing. But even as David prays for God to judge the wicked, he asks for mercy for himself so that he will not be swept away in God's judgment on them. And we have some great examples of this in the Bible. We have the example of uh, Noah and his family being spared from the worldwide flood in Genesis chapter 6. Then we have the example of Lot and his family in the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah where the angels went in and, and forcefully removed Noah and his, or Lot and his family, bringing them out of the city that's about uh, to be judged. You know, the false prophet Balaam, who uh, was paid by uh, Balak, uh, the king of the Amorites, to curse Israel, uh, and, it, and it couldn't happen because God would not let that take place. Uh, one of, in one of Balaam's oracles, he prays this prayer, let me die the death of the, of the righteous. And isn't that everybody's hope when you talk to them about what happens after we die? Everybody wants to go to heaven, right? And that's basically what Balaam is saying. But here, David is turning that around and he's saying, God, don't let, I know I'm a sinner, but based on your mercy, don't let me die the death of the wicked under your judgment. So he's, he's turning that around. And that's the beauty of God's grace, isn't it? That uh, he, will, he does not treat us as our sins deserve, and it's all because of his love for us in Jesus Christ. In one sense, you could say, Jesus died the death of the wicked under the curse of our sin. On the surface, of course, when you read the narrative, we see all the human injustice in the false accusations that were brought against Jesus. But behind it all and over top of it all was God's holy justice as Jesus suffered the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. Paul puts it this way in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So again, just dealing with that matter of justice, God is going to judge every evil deed. Jesus came and offered himself willingly to come under the curse 
of our sin, he became a curse for us. And that's the beauty of God's salvation and mercy. In the end, Jesus' name was cleared. God vindicated him by raising him from the dead. So it is a great thing to know, as Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, that the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for their day of judgment while continuing their punishment. So when you look around at all of the evil and injustice in the world today, uh, you know, another uh, refresher was the finding of those uh, graves of little kids in Kamloops, BC, and the injustice uh, behind all of that. With all of the injustice that is in the world, none of it is overlooked or disregarded by God. He will see that justice will be done. Uh, so David continues to pray for God's justice. Verse 4, repay them, David says, for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done and bring back upon them what they deserve. He's simply praying on that principle of God's justice, that every evil deed will be addressed and that nobody will get away uh, with what they have done. Punishing someone for their crimes is the basis of justice. And when, that's, when justice is not served, as we have seen, uh, just in the last year, people take to the streets demanding that justice be done. And here David is simply praying, God, uh, may justice roll down like waters. Uh, cause your justice to take care of the wicked deeds of uh, evil people. Jesus affirmed justice at the end of days in Matthew 16 and verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward every person according to what he has done. God's saving grace, the way that God has, has put together salvation, is that God's, uh, it, God's justice has been satisfied so that God can remain just and the justifier, the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus, as Paul uh, puts that in Romans 3 and verse 26. Uh, and then, as a result of trusting in God's saving grace, good works and holy living then flow out of being a person that is transformed by God. Uh, this comes through clear in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. So God knows you. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. The Lord knows those who are his. And the other thing that goes along with that is that everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So there we see the two parts of that. We come to God, we receive his mercy, even though we are guilty when we confess our sins and put our trust in him. And then uh, the other part of that is that uh, we live that out, that we turn away from wickedness. It's like the, the saying, uh, that the, uh, I think it was Martin Luther who came up with that, that we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It is accompanied by uh, striving to live a holy life. Uh, this section ends with verse five. Uh, Since the wicked show no regard for the works of the Lord and what his hands have done, he will tear them down and never build them up again. Evil actions come from evil hearts that refuse to love and worship God. In one word, unbelief. They see the works of the Lord, but they show no regard for them. People today have the works of the Lord in front of them in creation, as Paul says in Romans 1 verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's 
invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that they are without excuse. In the end, sustained unbelief is met with God's destruction. He will tear them down and never build them up again. Now, the psalm uh, really changes in its, uh, in its atmosphere and in its emotion. Uh, David breaks forth in praise and song for answered prayer. Verses six and seven. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy and I will give thanks to him in song. David had wrestled these things through in repeated prayer before the Lord, before he comes to a place of settled confidence in the promises of God, that God would bring the wicked into judgment and that David, by God's mercy, would be spared. I like how uh, Aaron Messner at Westminster uh, Presbyterian Church uh, expressed it. David praises the Lord for answered prayer, even as he prays it. And he gives thanks to the Lord for hearing his pleas for mercy within the same prayer that he desperately asks for the Lord to hear. Now we come to the final uh, two verses. Uh, Until now, the psalm has been the personal prayer and praise of David the individual, but now it expands to be a prayer for the people that David leads. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Though David was the anointed shepherd king of Israel in his day, he recognizes that the ultimate safety and guidance of God's people rests with the divine shepherd king, with none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so that is where our trust needs to be, in the fact that we have a shepherd king who is watching over us, who is guiding our lives, who is carrying us through difficult times, Uh, the one who is a fortress of salvation and the strength of his people. So that's what David does here in these final two verses, is he just expands his prayer uh, to all of those who are trusting in God, that God would save and rescue them. Based on Psalm 28, our hearts should be encouraged that God answers prayer. But maybe the place that you need to begin is with that humble uh, confessional prayer, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When Sandy and I got married, our first uh, place was the upstairs of a, a big old home in Coburg, Ontario. And we had a landlady and one of her Uh, favorite sayings was, I know that God hears my prayers because the Bible says that he hears the sinner's prayer and I know I'm a sinner. But you know, the thing that was lacking in her life was was repentance and asking for God's mercy. It it was this just this this funny little way that she had of, of acknowledging that she was a sinner and being sure that her prayer was heard. But you know, if you pray that prayer, truly uh, desiring God's salvation and his mercy, that is the place to start. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then you can have the confidence based on the saving work of Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross and through his resurrection from the dead, that God will be a fortress of salvation for you, that he will rescue you from your sin, that he will be there to help during times of trouble, that he will hear and answer prayer, that he will shepherd you and carry you forever right into your eternal home when that time 
comes. David's confidence and joy is that when God judges the wicked, he would not be swept away because of God's mercy to those who turn from sin and put their faith in Jesus. And if you need to do that, we would encourage you to do that today. And then as we wrestle things through in prayer and, and we're feeling at times like God is not listening uh, and that he's remaining silent and, and we, aren't, we aren't receiving an answer to our prayer, we just need to keep on praying and wrestle things through to the point that David does in Psalm 28 where he settles the matter based solely on the great and precious promises of God, where he says, my heart trusts in him and I am helped. We have those great and precious promises in the word of God and that is enough when we trust in him. The matter is settled and we can give thanks and sing for joy. I'm gonna close our time around God's word together with this benediction from Romans 15 and verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless and have a great week.